the initiation by one person, if followed by enough people, can make sus uh, a sustained uh, influ influence. But if you don't, if you just have wonderful individual people and you don't have anybody to follow them, it doesn't. But in this case, it certainly did. And it was Karen who was able to muster the troops. Had a lot of fun to be with. Karen DeCrow was born on December 18, 1937, in Chicago, Illinois, the oldest of two daughters of a businessman and a ballet dancer. Of her mother, Karen said, you would never think of her as a revolutionary, but she had an unusual background. In the 1920s, she went on the road as a ballet dancer, traveling across the country when women weren't supposed to do anything like that. Karen's father died when she was just 21, but her mother remained a driving source of support in Karen's life. Karen once remarked, one of my greatest treasures is the delight I share being with my mother. Together for more than 60 years, she is my first teacher, instructing me in talking, walking, reading, writing, drawing, and typing. I was born when she was two months shy of eight years old. Uh, as we got older, she had responsibilities for part of my care. She walked me to school, she would babysit me when that was age appropriate. And I would, we shared a room and I sort of was interested in watching what she did because at the early stage I was in the crib and she was being a 12-year-old or something. So there were pleasures of childhood that I know we shared. We liked nature, we liked the beach, we liked art, music. Our parents were culture vulture types, so that was all very early exposure. And even if it was differently acted on, we had that in our home. Mm -hmm. There were health problems that shaped some of what was going on. And my father died of heart failure. It's at 60 and he'd had heart attacks from when he was 48 so that really occupied a lot of my youth childhood uh, whereas Karen was graduated college living with a roommate by the time he died. Karen I f was a journalism um, major in college and wanted to write and really liked politics. She would canvas with our parents for political candidates before I was born and liked it. Mm -hmm. So it was clear that th things were, different things were going on mm -hmm. for us. Karen attended Chicago public schools. As a teenager, she enjoyed writing and sent short stories to top magazines hoping to be published. Karen's love for writing led her to Northwestern University's Medill School of Journalism, where she earned a bachelor's degree in 1959. Karen dreamed of a career as a journalist abroad, but learned that the field hardly offered an equal chance for women. After struggling to find appealing work, Karen finally accepted a job as a fashion and resorts editor at Golf Digest, despite having little interest in fashion or golf. In the early 1960s, Karen moved to Syracuse with her second husband, Roger DeCrow. Over the next few years, Karen wrote and edited for a variety of organizations and publishers while attending a master's program at the Newhouse School. On a rainy day in January 1967, Karen and her mother were watching TV when a talk show host mentioned the formation of a new women's organization so my mother and I sent in $10, said Karen. Was I a feminist at that point? Probably not. I hadn't thought a lot about equality between men and women. I am an economic determinist. I joined because I heard there was an organization formed to get women equal pay for equal work. So it was kind of an existential thing. First, I became a NOW member. Then I developed the philosophy or underpinnings of a feminist. Within a few months, Karen convened the first upstate chapter of NOW. Karen was very, very wise as she started the first NOW chapter, National Organization for Women in Syracuse. There were very few of us, 
at that point, but she knew that it was important to get information to the media in particular. By having us attack any, fem any uh, anti-feminism we saw in our own circumstances. And I was close to the Episcopal Church, so we took on the Episcopal Church. Quickly and loudly, she made her voice heard. In year one, responding to a New York Times article about equality, Karen wrote, women are not only poor, they are unequal. We are not in government, executive, legislative, judicial, except in numbers so token as to be laughable. As to the cause of this disparity, in 1968, Karen said, one must start with a memory that our grandmothers were not allowed to vote. Against this background, Karen put on her combat boots and got to work. In 1969, Karen ran for mayor of Syracuse. She said, it was so rare that I received international press attention, not for any ideas I might have had, but because I was running. The first in Syracuse, the first in New York State, one of the first in the country. Although Karen ran on issues, the press and her opponents focused more on Karen's appearance, especially her miniskirts, then popular in style. The year Karen ran for mayor, she also enrolled in the Syracuse University College of Law to better the cause. She saw it as a means to challenge sexist laws and represent victims of discrimination. Here she was, uh, running for mayor in a very hotly contested uh, c uh, contest right here in, in Syracuse, president of the National Organization of Women, and just as unassuming and uh, decent a human being as, as you could hope for. She, if you talk to her about her causes, you know, she was... Uh, she felt very, very strongly about them. And she would tell you exactly what, what she believed uh, without fear. But at the same time, she never uh, was one to think that because she was so deeply engaged in that situation that everybody around her was. And she was just a wonderful uh, classmate. She, uh, we, we would visit in the lounge and uh, she had a terrific sense of humor and she wasn't always talking about the National Organization of Women, for women, nor was she always talking about her political candidacy. She loved law school. She liked what we were doing, uh, never took herself too seriously. And uh, my recollection of her was just as, as a terrific human being. All sexism aside, something Karen acknowledged was a product of the times, Karen is grateful to the College of Law for giving her this wonderful profession. Although Karen was successful in law school, upon graduation she received no employment offers from law firms. So Karen resolved to build a practice in employment and civil rights law. By that time, after all, she had been a candidate for mayor, gained stature in National Now, spoken at the World Congress of Women in Helsinki about the American feminist movement, and authored the book, The Young Women's Guide to Liberation. As Karen was setting up her own practice, she also decided to make a run for the presidency of now. Why? As a leader, Karen said, you get to make policy. And the policy Karen wanted now to set was consistent eradication of all inequity by standing firmly against discrimination against women and gays, by supporting men's rights in the home and in the family, and by protecting a woman's right to choose. Her campaign slogan, Out of the Mainstream into the Revolution, captured the message. Karen's ultimate goal was a world where the gender of a baby will have little or no relevance to future pursuits or pleasures, 
personal, political, economic, social, and professional. There was an election taking place as to who should be president. And <clears throat> Karen um, did some politicking. She was a very shrewd politician uh, and defeated the opposition. And that's the way she got to be president. Karen fought heart and soul. She debated heavily and promoted vigorously ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. She went across the country debating Phyllis Schlafly, who was a legislator and author from the Midwest, about the Equal Rights Amendment and uh, supporting the Equal Rights Amendment. Had we had the Equal Rights Amendment, there is so much litigation today that we would not be having. Women still are not paid as much as men. Women still do not have the opportunities that men have. As president of NOW, Karen also traveled and lectured extensively on gender equality, abortion, feminism, politics, shared parenting, civil rights, father's rights, and the Equal Rights Amendment, both domestically and abroad. In 1988, Karen co-founded World Women Watch, an organization that pushed the United States government to advocate feminism abroad by stressing the view that the status of women should be included in any barometer of human rights. Karen was the first now president invited to the White House. One of Karen's lifelong missions was to educate people to understand that for women to achieve equality, the role of men in the workplace and in the home also had to be altered. Not everyone was on board with Karen's mission to take the movement out of the mainstream into the revolution. Indeed, 1975 brought formation of a dissident group of NOW members. Karen's response was captured in a New York Times article. There has been a great deal of attention paid to the fact that somehow, if the feminist movement pays attention to anyone but white, middle-class, straight women, we will somehow deviate from course. I feel the approach we ran on is the intellectually correct direction and the politically correct direction. The political, social, and economic plight of minorities and women are very similar. If you challenge gender role stereotypes, you must understand the homosexual issue. And so Karen gave birth to the phrase politically correct and worked mightily to eradicate discrimination of all forms. In 1975, Karen was to testify as an expert witness in the trial of Leonard Matlovich, the Air Force sergeant discharged for homosexuality. The judge ruled her testimony was irrelevant. It was Karen's steadfast commitment to gender equality and a person's right to choose parenthood that brought Karen to represent Frank Serpico, an unwed father sued for child support after he was deceived into becoming an unwilling biological father. Women have the right to choose whether or not to be parents. Men should also have that right. Men should not automatically have to pay for a child they don't want. It's the only logical feminist position to take. When Karen graduated from law school, the practice of law for women in Syracuse was far from equal or just. In June 1977, Karen convened the first meeting of what was later to become known as the Central New York Women's Bar Association. I first really got to know Karen uh, when she uh, 
was organizing uh, the Women's Bar Association uh, in this neck of the woods. I had known of her because I followed her exploits in the newspaper, but uh, we only became uh, close friends uh, over th that organization uh, what, 35 years ago. Uh, and we started out disagreeing heartily because I was a little nervous about the thought of women lawyers banding together uh, and not uh, getting integrated into uh, the legal life of the community. Uh, but uh, Ka Karen assured me that uh, we could do both. We could still aim to support the County Bar Association, uh, and, and that's how, how it turned out. One of the Central New York Women's Bar Association's first tasks was to integrate the Onondaga County Bar Association. Karen sent out a memorandum to women lawyers and legal workers inviting them to a reception stating, what better way to start the summer than for all of us to talk, eat chicken salad, plot, and who knows what. From that meeting, the Onondaga Five was born. First got to know Karen in about 1980. We had been meeting as a women in law group. And during the summer, a number of us who were newer attorneys had been active in the Bar Association on committees, trying to move our way up through the Bar Association. And one of our colleagues had gotten kicked out of the university club where the Bar Association held all of its committee meetings, and this meeting happened to be in the men's card room, so she was not allowed there. Karen DeCrow, Minna Buck, uh, Lois Kreisberg, Chris Gofield and I met on a Saturday morning to decide what to do about this, and out of that came the Onondaga Five. Eventually, we ran a slate of officers against the all-male Bar Association slate. And we didn't win, but we managed to get more people at that Bar Association meeting than had ever been held at an Onondaga County Bar Association meeting before. The next January, I was actually appointed at, to fill a vacancy on the Bar Board. And the year after that, a woman was, Beverly Michaels was, one of the officers in the Bar Association slate. So that's what the Onondaga Five sort of started the ball rolling. Not to hold grudges, Karen herself later served as a director of the Onondaga County Bar Association and on several of its committees. In 2008, Karen was honored with the Onondaga County Bar Association's Distinguished Lawyer Award. Karen devoted her entire legal career to cases promoting gender equality, eliminating discrimination, and protecting civil liberties. One case Karen viewed as highly significant was a lawsuit she brought on behalf of the Father's Rights Association of New York State, challenging female-only diaper-changing facilities. As a result of that lawsuit, the airport, and many other public facilities throughout the country, now have gender-neutral diaper-changing rooms. Karen also brought many lawsuits on behalf of girls and young women to gain equal access to opportunities and funding in sports. Careful what she wished for, Karen later said, I just hope all that playing and practicing won't keep women out of the library studying, learning, getting ready to take advantage of Title VII, the really important federal law, the one that prohibits job discrimination. Karen also fought to remove barriers to women in public accommodations. So the McSoy's case is very interesting. Um, it began in the Hotel Syracuse when Karen and a few other women uh, attempted to be served and couldn't be served because the Hotel Syracuse prohibited unescorted women from being served because they believed they were probably prostitutes and they were protecting their other clientele. That case was brought under the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which did not include sex as a prohibited uh, characteristic uh, for discrimination. McSorley's was different. We learned a lesson. Uh, in McSorley's, um, the case was brought under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. So in order to prevail there, 
you have to prove state action. And this was a bar. But think about it, a bar is so regulated, it must be licensed every year. There are, there are laws and regulations about who they can serve. They can serve habitual drunkards, for instance, that's in the law. Um, someone under 18 can't be served or even work in a bar. And we argued, as it turned out successfully, that um, there is state action when a bar refuses to serve women. Um, it was a creative way to bring the lawsuit, and it was successful, and it changed the view of where women are allowed or not allowed. And for that, I credit a lot to both Karen and Faith's persistence with this issue of equal accommodation for women. In 2009, a group of Syracuse lawyers took Karen to McSorley's for lunch. We were treated to six ales on the house. Fortunately, Karen lived to see some of the successes of feminism. In a June 1988 article, Karen wrote, Today the things we in now posited as wild and creative new ideas are widely accepted by most people. But when we started, we were definitely not in the mainstream. We were considered to be overturning life as everyone knew it. And in fact, we were doing that. Karen said, I take utter joy in using the laws in the year 2000 that I helped get drafted 25 years ago. Karen received many awards from various groups and individuals for her tireless efforts promoting gender equality. In 2009, Karen was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. Looking back on the changes shortly before her death, Karen said, I am lucky enough to have been involved in a movement that really moved, but we're not done. Karen will be remembered for her thoughtfulness and generosity, her typewritten notes of friendship, encouragement, and concern, and her love for cheap champagne. Her passion was something that she emoted to other people in a very gentle way. And I think that the best we can do to honor Karen is to keep fighting for all the principles that she held so dear. Karen was not afraid of death. In her words, I lived to see a world where a little girl could dream of being anything. And we do.